So setting, as I said, I will set the scene by have a look at the implications of um, the austerity policies that have been pursued um, on the context of collective bargaining, i.e. what happened procedurally in terms of wage setting arrangements and what happened in terms of um, actual outcome. My presentation or my brief input will be uh, structured in, in three parts. The first is the austerity story um, in a nutshell. The key I want to address here is basically um, a short outline why policymakers at European and national level uh, focused strongly on downward uh, flexibility of wages as the, the panic here <coughs> for the, the current economic problems. The second one is the new approach chosen to actually implement this um, austerity approach. And that's what I called uh, the new European wage policy interventionism, um, which essentially is a new approach of direct political intervention into collective bargaining. And uh, the third part will then be to look at some of the implications which this uh, direct interventionism um, into national collective bargaining had, both procedurally and in terms of bargaining outcomes. Now, the austerity story in a nutshell, I try to really present it very briefly, even if I run the risk of being oversimplistic. But um, <clears throat> I'm sure we will have a, a more detailed account than later on, um, and maybe a different analysis. Um, at, the, at the core of uh, the whole austerity measures um, is the firm belief or the central assumption that the current crisis actually is a, a cost competitiveness crisis. I mean, we had a lot of talk about cost competitiveness this morning already, but that's, that's at the very heart. Um, of, of everything, why wages play such a strong role in actually um, yeah, dealing with these macroeconomic imbalances. Um, this cost competitiveness crisis is essentially rests on uh, an uneven de development of uh, wages in surplus and, and deficit countries, which leads to uneven development in unit labor costs, uh, which means essentially we had some countries, the, the surplus countries, where the social partners had a very responsible policy, uh, wage policy, um, i.e. wages stayed in line with productivity. And then we had uh, these countries which uh, had excessive wage policies or excessive wage decreases, at least in excess of, of productivity, which means that unit labor costs increased. So we had a competitive wage gap uh, between these two groups of countries, which essentially meant that um, in these um, deficit countries, there was a falling external demand for products, and um, which in, in, in effect then led to an increasing trade deficit and current account deficit in these countries. So that's, that's the, the, as the story goes, in, as I said, very simplistic. But the conclusion then drawn was, okay, in a an, in an, uh, monetary union, we can't actually use uh, a currency devaluation, which is uh, a standard solution to, for competitive problems otherwise. So we pursue a strategy of internal devaluation uh, by putting downward pressure on, on, on wages. Um, the policy recommendations then was that in order to prevent excessive wage developments from undermining the competitiveness of countries, we need to do two things. The first is we need to ensure that wages stay in line with productivity. And the second one is we have to crack down on centralized collective bargaining systems. And I mean, that's basically what's enshrined in the uh, Euro Plus Pact, or which is also called Competitiveness Pact. Um, it's, the wording is a bit different there. Um, the, the signatory countries are actually asked to assess large and sustained increases in unit wage costs that may induce uh, erosion of competitiveness. Um, and uh, the adjustment of wage setting me mechanisms and notably the degree of centralization in the bargaining process. But what it all boils down to is put pressure on wages that they stay in line with productivity. And this is nominal wages and crack down on centralized collective bargaining systems. Now, the question now was how to implement uh, this, this approach. And that's what now I, I call, um, oh, 
not only me, but I mean Thorsten Schulden used that word as well. Um, wage policy interventionism, i.e. direct intervention into, into wages, wage setting and wage setting systems. And there are three different forms to do that. Um, the first one is the new system of economic governance, or make use of that, which now also applies to, to wages and wage questions, which enables uh, European policymakers to sanction non-compliance with policy recommendations. And as I said, these policy recommendations now also cover wage and wage policies. And that's uh, something new. Uh, the second uh, form is more direct. It's imposing wage cuts and collective bargaining reforms as a condition for financial assistance. And that happened uh, what the, in the framework of Memorandum of Understanding, which the Troika had with uh, countries like Greece, Portugal, and, and Ireland, but also with the EMF uh, in, in countries like uh, Romania, Latvia, and, and, and Hungary i.e. you introduce a certain kind of reforms, you cut wages, you decentralize your, decentralize your collective bargaining systems in return for uh, financial assistance. And the third is a bit more indirect. Um, that was when uh, happened in Spain and Italy, when the ECB made her, uh, its intervention on the, the sovereign bond secondary market, uh, conditional on the voluntary introduction of reforms in, in these countries. Now, um, the implication of each of these forms is exactly the same because it decreases the national level collective bargaining actors discretion, uh, discretion over policy choices and uh, it creates the framework um, actually to impose the desired austerity measures in those, in those countries. And to a certain extent, this um, actually represents a paradigm shift um, from the support of free collective bargaining, or at least the, assist, uh, the, the acceptance of free collective bargaining, to direct political intervention into national collective bargaining procedures and outcomes. And, um, well, the, this paradigm shift is all the more um, remarkable because in the, in the European Treaty, Article 153.5, the wages and the issue of wage policies are ex ex explicitly excluded from the realm of EU policies. Now, let's have a look at the, the changes. I don't want to go into too much detail, but this is just to, to illustrate um, the far-reaching implications this actually had on collective bargaining systems and, of course, of the trade union's capacity to negotiate as well. Because many of these procedural um, changes that have been introduced um, not only aim at the decentralization of collective bargaining um, but also like in particular here the promoting uh, the bargaining capacity of company level actors to negotiate firm level agreements this directly aims at the trade unions capacity to negotiate at the negotiating power of trade unions so these are the two the, the, the dual objectives uh, related to, to, to this approach and um, we can actually identify, when we have a look here, we can identify um, two groups of countries. The first one, and Ireland actually here, is a blank uh, column, which does not mean that nothing happened there. They are the implications where, uh, together with Romania, is the same case. Both countries, Ireland and Romania, were characterized by a highly centralized level of wage coordination, actually cross at cross-sectoral level. And that completely broke down. I mean, in Ireland, Kevin, you, you wrote about that. I mean, that was due to uh, the government's withdrawal from the whole uh, social um, uh, partnership process. So we went directly from cross-sectoral wage coordination to company-level bargaining, where we were 22 years ago before the social partnership process started. And in Romania, this was due to a unilateral law introduced by the government or introduced unilaterally by the government, and there we also have no central um, coordination of um, uh, bargaining anymore. And then we have the countries like Greece, Portugal, Italy and Spain, which were also characterized by a well-developed system of uh, sectoral level collective bargaining, and there the reforms, at least formally, left all the institutions in place the problem here is that the incremental or the, the, the successive implementation of one reform after the other 
basically eroded the, the, the operation, the, the practical operation of these institutions, which um, are, to a certain extent are not mere, mere shallows anymore. I mean, in Italy, to some extent, uh, the social partners have been more successful, or trade unions and employers have been more successful in fending off some of the implications of this uh, um, reform strategy. But in the other countries, this is actually a, a fundamental attack on, on existing collective bargaining structures. And the second impact, um, looking at bargaining outcomes, is we've heard about that from first-hand accounts this morning already in the countries like uh, Greece, um, Portugal, and uh, Italy, I think, were the, the interventions this morning. We have cuts in, in minimum wages or freezes, that's what the F stands for. We have the suspension of automatic wage increases, and we have, in particular in the public sector, uh, wage freezes or cuts in order to um, yeah, directly cut um, public expenditure. Now, this is the framework with which we discuss, you know, in which we discuss uh, the impact of wages or the role of wages uh, in, in coming to terms with the crisis. And when addressing the role of, of wages, um, the problem here is, or the, the open questions one might, one might consider when thinking about the issues are, first of all, are wage cuts and the dismantling of existing collective bargaining arrangements, are they the right cure for the current uh, problem of macroeconomic imbalances? And is there really a problem of cost competitiveness? Um, or is there rather a lack of non-price competitiveness in deficit countries? And here, I think one should take into, or one should keep in, in, in mind um, that when you look at which countries are these deficit countries competing with, I mean, are they really in direct competition with Germany, considering the, if you look at the so-called export basket and the complexity of the export basket of these countries? Are they in direct competition with, with, with Germany? Um, and, and therefore, does it really help if, if uh, we cut wages there? And does it improve their competitive position vis-a-vis -vis Germany? Um, shouldn't we rather pursue an alternative strategy of upgrading um, in this, their industry through structural investment as in the context of a more of a transfer union um, so that uh, they can develop new products, specialize in, in, in niche markets in order to produce these new products and to generate revenue jobs um, and repay the existing debts on that basis. Um, another thing which one should take into consideration when discussing these kind of problems is um, Low wages, I mean, they will also cut internal demand. Um, and does that actually compensate, or, or what's the relationship between a gain in comp cost competitiveness and uh, the decrease in demand? Does it equalize itself, or does it actually, does the, 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 the decrease in internal demand actually uh, compensate the, the, the positive effects of uh, cost competitiveness completely? And uh, the next thing, one other issue one might take into consideration is, I mean, if you look at the absolute level of wages, I mean, how far can you actually decrease wages in this uh, so-called deficit countries? Uh, because if they compete with the Central and Eastern European countries, the absolute wage level is much lower there. So, I mean, I think it's, you, you can't decrease wages in those countries that far so that they are actually cost competitive with, uh, compared to those CEE countries. I mean, these are all things one might take into consideration. I'm sure there are different uh, uh, views by, by uh, other uh, members of, of the panel, but uh, that's what I would like to suggest for, for discussion and uh, as uh, setting the, the frame. And I would like to ask now Mr. Turini to give his uh, analytical presentation. <laughs>